I don't know about preparing myself for a voiceover role, but I had to do an orgy for Mafia 3. Mm. And I was seven months pregnant, so that was weird. <laughs> yes, we're going to go there. And we have a cat in studio. You might have noticed this podcast went on hold after last year, but now it's back and better than ever. Yes, We're Going to Go There is a monthly podcast where we love to cut the BS, talk to inspiring people about what created their successful life journeys, and in the process, hopefully help someone else shorten their learning time gap. Your three hosts. I'm Gemma Laurel. I'm Jessica Hutchinson. And I'm Kevin Powell. Today we get to chat with the BAFTA award-winning voice actress Sissy Jones. From The Walking Dead to Firewatch to Call of the Sea and a host of roles besides, Sissy is known not only for her brilliant and moving performances in video games and animation, but for her incredible compassion, generosity and empathy, making her one of the most respected and loved people in our creative arts industry. How old were you when you first started playing around with your voice and characters? Oh, day one. I mean, as soon as I could talk, I was doing accents and, and you know, I thought Scooby-Doo was my best friend. So I would always, like, try to talk like Shaggy and try. I tried to do Donald Duck forever. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I've always been fascinated by character. I was really lucky to travel as a kid and... Every time we would go to a new place, I would try to speak like the locals and not get called out. Um, <laughs> Great. Very daring. Um, I don't know if I could do that now, but uh, I, I like I, I have a very specific memory of the day that I realized that Scooby-Doo and Shaggy and the crew had little black lines around them, and that meant that they were not real, that they were drawn, and I felt betrayed. I was like, oh, these bastards. But... It made me really lean into animation and the imagination that can come with animation. Um, I knew nothing of voiceover. I didn't even think about the people behind the voices. And I remember being like six or seven and being like, Dad, I want to be an actor when I grow up. And he was like, ha, 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 no. Um, <laughs> Every parent's worst nightmare. Yeah. So, you know, I went to college. I have a business degree and a Spanish degree. I do not have an acting degree. But it always called to me. And then when I learned that voiceover was called voiceover, I was like, oh, that, I want that. I, I, I want to do that forever. Man, I jumped in feet first and I never looked back. It was great. So going back to something you mentioned there. So business degree and Spanish degree. So you, you, went, into a, you went into a professional field and we've got that in common. Like my background is in IT. So what, yes. was, it that, what was it that took you to, to business and also, to, also to, to Spanish, to language as well? Was that a way of trying to shoehorn in an interest in that? I've always been someone that picks up languages. Um, my parents spoke Portuguese. My parents met in Brazil. And so I grew up listening to Brazilian Portuguese. Um, my mom has a degree in Spanish. And so... Languages just came easy to me, uh, so I I thought it was something that would be very useful, um, and it has been. Uh, I lived in Spain for a little bit; it was great. I want to go back, but business, you know, I went in, <laughs> I went into university wanting to be a marine biologist, and then I realized I suck at that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to PCAM and I was like, oh no 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 no, this is not my jam. Um, so I had a big sit back and think about like, what the hell am I going to do with myself? You know what? At the time it was, you know, the, the internet was kind of just, God, I sound old as fuck. Um, the internet was kind of coming up. It was right before the bubble burst. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, I guess, you know, business is kind of a generic enough thing. And I also had really wonderful parents who were like, listen, the degree is important, but it's the experience of college that's going to do more for you than the piece of paper. And that has 1000% held true. So I did the business degree as kind of a generic, look, I went to college. <laughs> uh, and I did Spanish because I just really like languages. And I, I, I knew that um, the Spanish speaking population in the United States was only growing. And um, I wanted to be able to communicate. So, yeah. That's such a pragmatic approach too, knowing that, you know, that you can be of service and be able to communicate with people who might not have English as a language that's natural to them. I think that really speaks to, to a characteristic of you that we all are very drawn to here, Gemma oh, and Kevin and I, you know, it's that very, 
um, warm hearted aspect of you, especially I think that comes through with that particular story of yours. So you went and you did a business degree, but then how did voice acting come to be for you? What was your very first gig? And when did you make the choice to, when you finished college, to just dive into something completely different? Yeah. So, um, like I said, I, well, I graduated college in 02, uh, 2002. Fuck, that was almost 20 years ago. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels like it was a week ago sometimes. Um, and I, the bubble had just burst. So everyone everywhere was freaking the fuck out. Um, I can swear on this, right? Am I going to get in trouble? Oh, yeah, of course you can. Yep. Uh, and I was in a state called Oregon. Oregon had the worst economy in the nation at the time. And I did not want to move home to my home state, which is Idaho, which is a very rural um, a uh, very kind of, uh, red state, if you know anything about American politics. So, uh, I didn't want to move back and live with my parents. So I was at a graduation party one night and I was talking with a friend of a friend and he was like, yeah, I live in California. I wait tables at a sushi restaurant and I make like 300 bucks a night in tips. And I was like, can you give me a job? And he was like, Yeah. <laughs> So I straight up moved yeah. to California on the promise of a fucking sushi job. Um, <laughs> you had the most California and, entrance to California. Dude, it so was. And, you know, it didn't. Listen, the guy that owned the, the joint, I think he had a debt to the Yakuza because we never got our money on time. He would hold our tips for like three or four weeks. I ended up having to work at Wells Fargo, which was awful. Um, but I remember someone saying to me, what if you fail? And I was like, well, now I'm not going to, so fuck you. Because um, <laughs> yeah. I just have that little bit of spite in me. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I waited tables, and from there, um, you know, I had this group of, of uh, venture capitalists who would come in and sit at my table, and they would request to sit in my section. And, you know, I'm cheeky, and we would laugh and joke around and whatever, and uh, they offered me a job. And so I left waiting tables and I went to work for one of the foremost venture capital firms in the world called Sequoia Capital. Um, they're the people that put the initial money into Google and PayPal and Yahoo and YouTube. I mean, these guys are literally creating the future. It's, it's incredible. So I worked as a, a receptionist there. And then within a couple of weeks, I, I was promoted to executive assistant. And I worked as an, as an EA for a couple of years. And, you know, from there I went to a startup company. And then from there I went to another company. And I ended up working for this one company. This is a very roundabout story. I'm sorry. But, Don't apologize. Uh, this is great. <laughs> mm. I, I had a horribly abusive boss. And she was just nasty. And, like, she stuffed me in a, in a room. She made me move offices every couple of weeks. And she stuffed me in a room that had those horrible blinky blinky lights overhead and I was getting migraines every day and um, oh. she was awful. And I, I felt like a battered wife. I, I felt so abused and so miserably unhappy. Um, I remember having a conversation with my now husband and just bursting into tears because I just, I felt so useless and, and worthless and she took everything and and kept going. Uh, she was awful. Um, That's super relatable, though, Sissy, because so many artists have have to take other jobs, you know, to supplement their income. And and I've been in a corporate situation like that many times, where you just feel yeah. like you're being, like you said, a battered wife. It's emotional yeah. abuse. It's a hundred thousand million percent emotional abuse. Um, that is not to say I did not meet incredible people during my time in the Silicon Valley. I really, truly, I met my husband. Oh. Like, I met some of the most amazing people that I'm still friends with, and I learned so fucking much from. However, she was awful. So um, during that time, my husband and I took a trip to Alaska, and we went out on the water. Uh, my uncle has a boat up there, so we went out salmon fishing for 10 days um, on the open ocean. And it's, it's, it's a boat. It's kind of small. So you get 10 days to sit around and shoot the shit. <laughs> like weird things come up. And so my, my aunt, who was like my favorite human on God's green earth, she said, uh, you know, I, I, I know you're so unhappy. What if you could do anything? What would it be? What's your dream job? And I was like, I want to be a voice on the Simpsons. That looks like so much fun. But you probably just got to live in Hollywood. Like I, I didn't, I did not know the term, the word voiceover. Um, 
end of conversation, yada, 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 caught a couple salmon. It was great. Um, came home maybe two weeks later. I'm not even kidding. I was getting ready for work in the morning, and I, I used to listen to the morning radio show, and Nancy Cartwright, who is Bart Simpson, came on the radio show talking about voiceover and how it's the best job in the world. I have so much fun. You know, the Simpsons movie is coming out, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and by the way, you guys here in the San Francisco Bay Area, you have one of the best voiceover schools in the country right in your backyard. And I was like, what? Uh, literally called that day, started taking classes that week, and two years later was able to leave my job um, and jump into voiceover face first. So I signed in San Francisco first. I booked my second audition out the gate, which was Katya in The Walking Dead. It was great. And then and then I just I started booking like book, 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 book. It was great. San Francisco is a very different market than L.A. So I came to L.A. because I had met um, my current agent at a class in San Francisco. So I met with him and he was like, listen, you've got it. You have it. Let's let's give this a go. And I was like, fuck. So we did. And uh my husband and I moved here. So let's see, I got signed in San Francisco in September of 2010. I got signed in LA of November in November of 2010. And then we moved here in June of 2011. And I didn't book for a year. A year. Dry spot. Like nothing. Mm. And I was freaking out and I was panicking because my husband was still commuting to Northern California, which is a plane ride um, every week. And, uh, you know, I was so scared and mm -hmm. I wanted it so bad uh, you know the other thing that really in addition to coaching and and getting my mental health mm -hmm. in check which please if you don't have someone to talk to please find someone to talk to there's nothing wrong with antidepressants there's nothing wrong with anti-anxiety medication there's nothing wrong with therapy um get your mental health in check because as an actor if you don't you're done no matter how amazing voiceover is it, it's hard. There are days that are just really hard. Anyway, um, in addition to all of that, um, finding my people, finding my network, finding my friends, finding a, a community here. You know, I talk a lot about how much I love voice actors because I fucking do. You know, there's this whole stereotype of Los Angeles. And when I was moving here, I was really scared. I was really scared that everybody was going to be cutthroat and mean and nasty and cat fights. And no, None of it. I mean, listen, in my time in L.A., I've maybe met five assholes that do voiceover. That's it. I've met thousands of voice actors, and the majority of them are unreal. Just really incredibly kind, supportive, bolstering. There when you need them, and there to celebrate with you, and there to commiserate with you. And that's important, you know? Community, I've certainly found as well, is everything. Like you can't yeah. go it alone. You can't do it alone. And the bulk of my work has definitely been by word of mouth and people giving me a shot. So it's the relationship yeah. building in in the non spammy, desperate, hammy way. Yes. Yeah. My agent and I joke around a lot that like what we do is like 10 percent talent and 90 percent hustle. Right. And the hustle includes <laughs> networking, going to conventions, meeting people, not overstaying your welcome, mm. not not spamming email, but like having a, a casual discourse on Twitter, you know, um, it matters, it makes a difference. Yeah. Following on from some of the points you've made already, I'm just wondering if there might be something a little extra there. What's something you wish you'd known when you first started your voiceover career? Treating it like a business. It's not a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a hobby for some people, but the way that I run mine I make my sole income out of this little box in my face, in my body. So I treat it like a business. I have my numbers. I, my agent is a partner. Um, I can't tell you how many people have said to me, oh, I got an agent. The hard part's over. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> oh, the hard dear. part's just starting. <laughs> But, you know, understanding that um, when I started 10 years ago, the uh, the average booking ratio for a national union television spot, which is the unicorn, right? That's the one that pays money, uh, was 150 auditions to one booking. Oof. That was 10 years ago. And that was before celebrities were doing them all. Mm. So knowing that I'm not going to book everything and that's OK. I, th I think 
what you said is to- is totally valid because you know something that I have to keep reminding myself too with my own anxiety is that when I go in for an audition, you know, my job is not to get the job. My job is to do the best version of this character or the best version of whatever this thing is that I'm doing because it's the instant that I focus on it being oh, I have to get a job, that's when the desperation mm. kicks in. That's yeah. when I don't do a good mm. performance. And yep. that's when you don't get called back. So actually treating it like, no, I'm, I'm in to do this thing and I'm going to throw it away once it's done is such a healthy perspective to take. There is a job that I have supposedly booked that I auditioned three years ago and we haven't recorded yet. Um, so holding on to something like that, you know, oh, did I book it? Did I? <laughs> you know, why? And does it hurt sometimes to hear it on the air with somebody else and... and yeah, of course. Sure does. But I wasn't right for it at that time for whatever reason. Move on. I am putting together an event for the first uh, weekend in March um, called the Voiceover Summit with uh, participation of the Safara Project. And one of the things that we're talking about is mental health. And not only what I said earlier, but also just how do you deal with imposter syndrome and how do you deal with jealousy when someone books a thing that you think you did beautifully and then you hear it on the air and you're like what the fuck Mm. right how do you deal with that and one of the things I loved is that the one of the therapists that we have coming to talk was like that's when you get curious that's when you look inward and say why am I feeling this way how can I flip this to celebrate the person that did book it and realize that there is enough to go around right and it's a constant thing You know, we are humans, we are bred to be jealous and to want all the things, but it doesn't serve you. So how can you move past it? It's just paramount to surviving this business. That sounds incredible as well, because there's so much in the industry that's set up around supporting, here's how to replicate this accent, here's how to book in this medium. But those, and I I don't want to say softer in a reductive sense, but looking at those different aspects of Here's how to like. Here's how to to create an interior landscape that's sustainable. How did you come to How did you come to a place where that was a priority for you? And how did you find a group of like? How did you become a group of? Because looking at the people who are involved in the summit, it's an amazing group of people. Like, what brought you all together to create such a wonderful thing? So, Dr. Rena Gupta and Mindy Pack. So, Dr. Gupta is one of the foremost laryngologists in the world. Um, She focuses solely on the larynx, so she does a lot of work with SAG-AFTRA, which is our union here in the States, and uh, singers. So she helps people when there's trouble. She does the scope to take a look at your chords and make sure everything is looking okay. And she she helped SAG-AFTRA a lot when they were doing the renegotiating with the video game companies for uh, vocally stressful sessions. So I went to her a year ago it was right before the pandemic because I really wanted to start talking about vocal health. And, you know, we are expected to go into these some of these sessions and scream bloody fucking murder for hours and walk out and be like, OK, great, bye, you know, and we are not warmed up. We are not cooled down. There is no anything in between to help us with our vocal safety. Um, and it, I, I don't like that. I have seen people blow a cord and never be able to do voiceover again. I have seen people get a polyp and have to have surgery and they're out for four months. We don't have fucking unemployment. Like if I don't work, I don't get paid. So four months off. I, listen, I had a baby. I got eight days of maternity. That's it. So I feel like we need to have more tools to protect ourselves. And we need an industry that is wanting to help us do that. So roundabout. I went to Dr. Gupta and I was like, hey, I would love to do this. Um, I want to do a free webinar. I want to get as many people involved as I can. I will pay you for your time. Would you come do this with me? And she was like, yes. And let's get Mindy Pack. She's a speech pathologist. She works with Justin Timberlake and Miley Cyrus and like all of these incredible singers. Let's get her involved because she has uh, developed the voice straw which is a a really great tool for warming up and for taking care of your voice. And so the three of us started working on putting together this free webinar, which we did last year. I think we had 200 attendees and they did it for free. They didn't charge me a dime, which I thought was very cool. And we talked about all the questions that we have and nobody talks about like allergies and how do you clear your throat and 
you know, how can you tell if you have a vocal injury and what do you do in the middle of a session when, you know, it's going sideways, blah, 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 all of that. It was amazing. So we kept talking. We did another webinar and then they were like, hey, we have this thing called the Savara Project that we've typically been working with singers on, but I think we could really do something cool with voice actors. What do you think? And I was like, yes, can I can I tell you what I would want to attend? Mm. Because I, I definitely see value for people getting into voiceover and, and, you know, resources for them. But more so, I wanted to do something I wanted to be at. You know, I I'm 10 years in and there are a lot of things I still don't know. There are a lot of people I still want to learn from. And so they were like, yeah. Who do you who do you want to who do you want to get? Let's mm. let's let's map it out. And so I created my dream convention and they were on board a thousand percent. And uh, every single person that we asked to be a part of has said yes, which is incredible. So we've got this really killer lineup with the mental health professionals, Dr. Gupta. Actually, I'm going to Dr. Gupta's later this week to do. <laughs> I'm going to get the scope up my nose, Ooh. looking at my cords and then do the straw with efforts to show a before and after i'm really excited yeah so we're going to talk about basic anatomy of your vocal cords and how to protect them we're going to talk about mental health we're going to talk about finances um Mm. i recorded a session yesterday with my agent and this incredible voice actress named zara fuzzle talking about the agent talent relationship which again is something that is so mystified like we just don't talk about how to manage that relationship Um, We have a looping director who came to give us a a talk about looping, which is a whole other can of worms. Um, We're going to talk about, we're talking, we did a, uh, I don't know if it's been announced yet, so I shouldn't say that, but uh, (laughs) we're going to do one about musicality in voiceover and how um, having a basic grasp of music concept can be Mm. immensely valuable in voiceover. Mm. Uh, And all these incredible, I mean, Tom Keegan is going to do an uh, audition feedback course. Uh, If you don't know Tom Keegan, please look him up. He's one of the most incredible directors I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I put together my dream convention and, and they let me. <laughs> awesome. Because we need that kind of discussion in not just singing, but also the voiceover sector. Like you're, yeah. the fact that's touching on health, mental health, auditioning, yeah. the reality of the agent relationship. I'm looking, I'm busting. I've already got day two and I'm like, oh, I want to do that as well. So I can <laughs> budget it out. But it is a fantastic so lineup. Three days. Yeah. Oh. And if you aren't available to attend it live, the stuff will be available online until March 10th, at which point we'll take it down because we don't, you know, we want to respect our speakers and not put their mm. proprietary information out there forever. Um, but which yeah, is I'm, excellent for those of us who aren't in a Pacific time zone exactly, either, right? Exactly. I, I was just talking with my husband about this today with like, I wonder what's going to happen with these kind of events going forward, because this does give us the opportunity to have our friends in Australia attend or our friends in the UK, you know, and not have to buy a plane ticket to come to Los Angeles for it and all this stuff. Mm. So, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I think it's really something special. I'd never seen anything like this. I mean, I've been to other events and they are wonderful and they do an incredible job with with what they do. But I really wanted this to target people who have been doing this for a couple of years and are pretty solid in their careers and live in LA, you know, and other places, but you know, work. It's just, it's everything I've always wanted to see. At Yes, We're Going to Go There, we like to give back to the game development community that's been so good to us when we can. This episode, we'd like to tell you about Frog's Princess by Joy Ever After Stories. You can find a link to the website for Frog's Princess in the show notes. Emma's eldest sister is clever and kind. Emma's second sister is brave and beautiful. Emma's... uh, just Emma. They tell her she's a true princess, but what does that mean? How can she save her kingdom from evil? No one will even listen to her. Francis has jumped into trouble one too many times. Now... He has to rescue his bodyguard who got three iron bands around his heart trying to stop a witch turning Francis into a frog. And the only way he can do that is to turn back into a prince. And the only way he can do that is to get a princess to kiss him. Emma says then they'll have to get married, but what's the problem with that? Follow Emma and Francis in their movie-length click-through adventure, Frog's Princess. 
I just want to gush. Like, I just want to gush at how amazing <laughs> this entire conference sounds. You know, it's... But I do think this this conference is a real testimony to you because you're you're being the change that you want to see, right? And I think that that's a real sign of someone with natural leadership qualities who doesn't just want to make their own careers flourish, but wants to make other people's careers flourish. And that's that's a really beautiful thing to be able to do for people. Thank you. I have realized in the last five years or so how important it is to support one another, right? Obviously, you know, friends and everything else, you do that for one another. But in this particular business, I just, I love the people so much and there is enough to go around and I don't have to hoard it all and Mm -hmm. neither do you or you or you or them. Right. And so how can we, how can we be the rising tide? How can we lift all the boats? You know, um, I know that sounds so Pollyanna, but I, I'm not a competitive person. I don't enjoy beating people for a thing um i just want to spread kindness and acceptance and love and if that makes me cheesy as all hell it's who i am (laughs) we welcome cheese and we love it spread more of the cheese around (laughs) (laughs) exactly (laughs) this is a serious podcast right (laughs) V serious. V. <laughs> it's very serious. We all just we all just squirted fake cheese in our mouths. <laughs> we should do a screenshot of that. That'll uh, market I, it. We just squirted fake fake cheese into our so, mouths. Speaking of serious, so. this this is something that's obviously totally not serious. But I would like to ask you about uh, your current work that you're doing on Instagram with the TikTok trends <laughs> because that just looks so like good. so much fun. It really is. So it it was born out of um, interviewing the looping director for for this summit. Like, I, I, I shit you not. She said she is starting to look at casting on TikTok. And uh, she said, anybody who wants to do this needs to have a TikTok account. And I was like, oh, fuck, I don't want to. And she said, why? You know, you have Twitter, you have a Instagram and all this other stuff. Um, Look at Shelby Young. If you don't know Shelby Young, look her up. She's an incredible voice actor. She has over a million followers on TikTok just doing silly voice things. And uh, she's been contacted by Newsweek about one of the voiceover challenges, right? So it's like, she's like, why not? And I, um, it's daunting. You know, uh, I have kids. I am not in my 20s. (laughs) So it's yep. <laughs> dedicating a lot of energy to a new thing. Um, but it's been fun. You know, I, I'm on this show on um, Disney called The Owl House, and I love it with my entire soul. And I love my character. And, um, you know, it's on hiatus right now as they're filming season two. And it's been fun to do something for the fans, you know, because mm. she's just a great character. And it's a great show. It's a wonderful show. I, I Anyway, people mm. are happy to see her and I'm happy to be an idiot so (laughs) what's the weirdest thing you've had to do to prepare yourself for a voiceover role I don't know about preparing myself for a voiceover role but I had to do an orgy for Mafia 3 Mm. and I was seven months pregnant (laughs) so that was weird (laughs) oh wow oh my god (laughs) yeah well are there other voice actors live with you or was it just you recording on your own in the booth situation on my own (laughs) on my own in a booth just having the things, doing the stuff. One Did you reference any deaf efforts? Or, <laughs> because I find that when you're doing deaf and stuff, it all ends up sounding like you're having sex in the booth by yourself. So, Actually, uh, Liam O'Brien, who uh, directed a couple of um, uh, things when I first came here, uh, told me that efforts are the perfect combination of poop and sex. <laughs> <laughs> it's all bodily functions, you know. Pretty much. So... Take that with you for the rest of your life because it's been living in my head rent free. So, <laughs> <laughs> problem shared. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there is that awkward thing when you hear, like, when you hear, a, a, for me especially, it's hearing like a, a, a woman character in a fighting game. You're like, what's happening there exactly? <laughs> yep. Did you? Mm, yeah. Yeah. But for me, it was always Lara Croft climbing up a ladder, and I was like, I've never heard someone grunt like that going up a ladder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't grunt, gav- you know, every, uh, uh, no, it's, no. Yeah. Anyway. 
we can have these conversations and I love that. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So you were talking uh, I've gotta find it. I've got to move on from that, isn't it? I've gotta find I've gotta find the you know I'm gonna go back to a neutral energy here. Uh-huh. So Good what, luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a poop answer sex. <laughs> It's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to know, and I yes. think I know the answer to this, but I want to ask you, Sissy, what is the one role you've always wanted to play, but you've never had the opportunity to do so? I will preface this by saying all of the roles that are already out there, Wonder Woman, Supergirl, Catwoman, you know, all of these huge things have already been done beautifully by other incredible actors. I want Jane Bond. If we're talking characters, I want Jane Bond. I want to see a character who is capable, intelligent, sexual, but not that's not her only shtick. Mm -hmm. um, um, mature, um, you know, adventurous. I, I, I would love to play that. I'd give my right arm to play that. I think it'd be so much fun. If you're talking uh, non-character, I want more tentpole movie trailers. I really want to hear more women in movie trailers. And it has, it's been a ceiling I've been trying to shatter for a long damn time, and it is hard. You know, not only is there fewer and fewer voiceover in movie trailers, um, but it is, the, it is cornered by a handful of men um, who are very good at what they do. I do not want to take that away from them at mm. all, but... You know, when you see Wonder Woman with a man on the trailer, like, it's just, it's a little crushing. You know, I really would love to see more women doing that. Yeah, I can understand why so many people would find it difficult, or rather, why it would be hard for women to break into that when there's so few examples of it existing in the first place. Mm. There are two trailer campaigns, and I'm talking the full front-to-end campaigns that I can think of. Magic Mike. My friend Cami Gladich did Magic Mike, and Gone in 60 Seconds was Melissa Disney. Um, I had an indie campaign in September, but it was like four four trailers. I've done trailers as sound-alikes, so oh. like, you know, Charlize Theron for Atomic Blonde, right? Um, or I did a one-off for John Wick 2 because it was opening the same day as Fifty Shades of Your Face or whatever, and so they wanted to, like, do a cheeky take on it. But even Fifty Shades of Your Face had a dude on the trailer. I am ready for some change. <laughs> mm, hell yeah. <laughs> because there's enough to go around. Yeah. There's enough to go around. I don't I don't want my male friends to be out of work. I don't want my female friends to be out of work. I want my friends of, of color to be able to work and my white friends to be able to work. Like there is enough yeah. to go around. And I think anyway. this goes back to this goes back to something that um it, it's kind of a broader thing. Like we needed to have Tomb Raider before we could have Salt, before we could have Atomic Blonde, and we could have these roles where we see women in in increasingly more capable areas. I don't know yeah. if this is a question that you can answer because this might get into the politics on the ground there. But when it comes to trailers, so obviously you know if you can't see it, like you can't believe that it's a it's an effective thing. But what is the barrier there? Is it preconception or is it a market that is very tightly defended? Both. Both. Mm. In the States, we have agents and we have voiceover managers. Now, a voiceover manager is a, totally different from an on-camera manager. Um, a voiceover manager is someone who specializes in the markets of trailers and promos because in a typical audition process, let's say commercial, a casting director is going to get upwards of a thousand auditions for a single commercial. AAA titles, same thing for every character. Trailers and promos happen so quickly, like boom, 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 boom. I will literally get an audition and need it back within 30 minutes. They don't have time. So they have relationships with managers and they will send the manager a request and get two to three, maybe five auditions back from the manager. And there's a couple of managers in LA. So they'll maybe have 10 auditions to sift through, pick the voice and move on. Oh. Um, so there's that. And a manager is, you know, my agent gets a plus 10%. So if I make $1,000 on a session, I bring home $1,000, he gets $100. My manager gets a 10% of my take home. So my manager also gets $100. That means I take home 900 So they get 10% of everything I make. That's fine. 
so there's that. It's expensive. And I am one of four women, five women that my manager represents because there's just not a lot of work for women in this field. Mm. Um, also, it is very tightly guarded. It can be a little political sometimes. Again, the men who do the trailers are incredibly talented. I, I'm not taking a dime of that away from them, but it's pretty tightly held. There's also general preconception. I had I, <laughs> a couple of years ago, there was a female buddy adventure movie. And they wanted me to do the trailers. They hired me for the campaign. I recorded 50 spots for them. 50. I recorded at 11 o'clock at night. I recorded from a camping trip with my family. They said jump. I said how high. And the week before it was set to go to market, the head of the marketing at the studio that it was being released from said, "Um, why don't we just get that guy that does The Bachelor? And it was gone. Poof. Gone. Because everybody thinks that they need dudes. Now, the interesting thing is, when that film released, one of my best friends knew the filmmaker. And so we went to the release party at the filmmaker's home. And she told her friend, this woman almost did the trailers for your movie. And she said, what? I had no idea. If I would have known, I would have fought for you. Because it's all done for the marketing department. Right? Mm. There's no right. communication. Um, and it's... It's a tightly guarded thing within the marketing departments of production companies. Now, they obviously know what they're doing, right? Like they, they've successfully done this for a long time, but nobody wants to be the first. You know mm. what I mean? Nobody wants to be the one to break the mold. So, and, and you see it with everything. You see it with, with animation. You see it with, you know, whatever. Like um, Phineas and Ferb, I think they, they shopped Phineas and Ferb around for seven years before someone bought it. Hmm. And then everybody wanted to do a Phineas and Ferb, right? So it's just the nature of business. We are risk averse. So I'm trying to raise awareness. And that's the other thing, too, is that a lot of people don't even think about it. When hmm. I say I would love to be the trailer voice of a tentpole superhero movie, most people say, oh, my God, I never even thought of that. Yeah. I didn't even realize I've been listening to a dude all my life, mm. right? We just don't think about it. We're so used to it. We're so used to Don LaFontaine in a world. Right. Yeah. Um, and so raising awareness about it is, is part of it as well. Well, until somebody does it and it becomes a huge success and then everyone wishes they were the first that did it. <laughs> Everybody will clamor to do it. Yeah. 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 It's a process. You know, mm -hmm. I love my manager, Debbie Cope. Um, she is a, a true partner in every sense of the word. And we are constantly trying to figure out how we can angle in. I look forward to the day when that's a reality. And as, oh, yeah. as a fan of media... I am so ready. I am so ready. All of you all, if you're listening out there and you make stuff for a competent, like a competent character, like you described in a production that is created with a female gaze and not a male. And the point you made about sexuality is so true. Like having that be a part of the character, but not, not it be the, the in for the character. Or, the or defining trait. Yeah. Because we've seen that so, so many, we've seen that so many times. Yes. And I, that, this is the point I wanted to come back to. Um, there's a tremendous actress named Erin Yvette. Um, she is Snow in The Wolf Among Us, and uh, she's in Oxenfree, and she was the, the personal demon in After Party. Jesus, if you haven't played that, she's brilliant. Um, but she said something in an interview that has stuck with me like crazy. We have gone so far in the opposite direction from damsel in distress to strong badass female character that we've left out all the gray in between mm. you very rarely get to see a strong female character who's also goofy and silly and able to play the joke and mm. you know what i mean and so with Kristen wig and and some of these characters we're kind of starting to get back there a little bit but um but it's so much fun to exist in that gray you know and to to have the ability to play an actual human you know, mm. who is serious and smart and capable, but also goofy and, and trips up sometimes and, you know, enjoys a good laugh. Yeah. It, it, it's so static to just be like, but I'm a badass, <laughs> like the whole time, yeah. you know? Yeah, the pendulum yeah. swung so, one way and it's gradually coming back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it definitely feels like as women, we're clawing, we're clawing our space, you know, we're, 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 we're reclaiming, but we're, we're reclaiming in weird stages to try and get levels of acceptance so that we can have those messy gray characters yeah like who wouldn't want to be messy 
Yeah. That's where the deliciousness is. It's life. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think they're the best moments when something goes completely how you don't expect it or you react in a way that's not the standard way of reacting. It makes it interesting. Well, and I think that's what I think that's where Delilah from Firewatch really struck a chord with people is because she didn't need a man. She chose the non traditional route. You know, she zigged when everyone else zagged. She's funny. She's <laughs> flawed. Uh, she's jaded. She drinks too much. Um, you know what I mean? Like she yeah. was so fun because I just got to be a person, a three dimensional human. It was so much fun. And yeah. having played that, like before I met you, like my heart leapt out as a player hearing the vulnerability in those moments, because it gives you, it gives you this beautiful jagged line between your character and her, where there are moments of strength and vulnerability in each and it's humanity. It was oh, yeah. just so good. You killed me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but yay. <laughs> she was the joy of a lifetime. She really was. I mean, that, that whole experience top to bottom was, was really, truly something else. We just passed the five-year anniversary of that game coming out. I can't wrap my head around it. This is probably a question more related to when you were starting out. Like we've talked about auditioning and we've talked about leaving the audition at the door. Did you find it a challenge at any point? You work on a project, the project is done uh, and you're paid fantastic, you're out the door. But the public perception of you outside of the market like doesn't shift until that releases. And there's such a long timeline with games. Like these things basically can take yeah. years. Did you ever carry that weight around or were you able to yeah. leave that behind as well? I did. Yeah. I mean, when I had been cast in Firewatch, well, Sean approached me and then it was six months before I heard anything back. And then, you know, I was convinced I'd been recast and going through all the shit that we do. Um, and then it was a two year period of recording. And they, you know, they were amazing. They let me talk about it. You know, it wasn't this crazy NDA or we'll take your firstborn situation. Um, they let me do press around it. I mean, they were just incredible which is it's very rare games are games are typically incredibly secretive mm. but around that time when i had first gotten cast in firewatch i had also landed my my first would have been my first leading role um which ended up being firewatch but i had landed what would have been my first leading role and i was over the moon i was so excited i they flew me up to the city that it was being filmed in and we recorded 30 hours and it was it was an ensemble record, so I got to be mm. in the booth with my scene. And it was so special. And then I got fired because I didn't have enough Twitter followers. And uh, oh. and it broke my fucking heart. And, um, you know, listen, I've since been recast and things. It happens all the time. My agent says, you're nobody till you've been recast. That's fine. The way it, <laughs> the way it happened was deeply personal and um, not great, but whatever. Mm. And I remember seeing in one of the um, forums, because I was too stupid to not read the comments, when they were talking about Firewatch, someone said, who the fuck is Sissy Jones? She's never been a lead. I bet she can't carry it. And um, I panicked. I panicked. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was hurtful because I was so new and mm -hmm. I'd done a lot of like additional voices, you know, because that's what you do yeah. in games. And I had massive self-doubt. Can I pull this off? Am I good enough for this? Blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, do I need to get more Twitter followers? Blah. <laughs> Did you consider paying for that at some point? Did that enter your mind? I talked to my agent about it, and he was like, listen, this comes down to star fuckery. At the end of the day, these people want to work with celebrities, and uh, that's what they're going to do. So it has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. um, you can go buy the followers. I, I think it's a waste of time. My agent is so great. I love him so much. Um, Dean Panero, mm -hmm. I love you. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was heartbreaking. And, you know, listen, it's still scary. You know, the night before Firewatch came out, I felt like I was going to throw up all over the place. I was mm -hmm. so nervous. I was terrified that people were going to hate it, hate me, not get it, not get me. Because it was such a deeply personal game as well you know I, Delilah is very different than I am but she's also a whole lot of me mm. and um, Sean told me while we were writing that you know he was able to write her better because he knew me right mm -hmm. and so it's a deeply personal role 
And I had the same thing the night before Call of the Sea came out. Oh, God, are people going to hate it? Uh, is anybody like, mm, you know, it's nerve wracking. It's mm. one thing to be in a game. It's one thing to be in The Last of Us 2 as some random background chatter. It's another thing to be the character that player spends hours and hours and hours and hours and hours with. Mm. And if they hate you, you will hear about it. Mm. And it's really scary. Mm. The Call of the Sea was so freaking good. Oh, thank you. Loved that. Loved it. I selected how I ended. And I just had to go on YouTube because I just wanted to find that out what happens the other way. <laughs> I was like, this is cheating. I should play it all over again. But anyway, just spoiler. It was such a joy. It was such a joy to work on. I mean, I just, I love, I love my job. I do. I, there's very few times I've been like, well, that sucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I feel so lucky and so truly, truly humbly grateful to do what I do. That's the end of our conversation with the amazing Sissy Jones. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed our time chatting with her. You can keep up with everything happening with Sissy via the social media links in the show notes of this episode. And you'll also find more information about the VoiceOver Summit there. Thank you for listening.